that he's quite the package I missed for all my high. Yeah. Always on my mind, ever with me, being busy from coast to city, I trust for all my time. Ego, where are your amigos? Town in town, gather with my people. He let me go. Yeah, free though. Hips swing round, lighting up the town in a GB3 flow. In and in out of ego, I go. If not in it, I want to be with it. Right side. Drags through my heart yeah, Always on my mind Never with me Being pretty from coast to city I love Sharing my love Ego Where are your amigos? Come, come round The hardest sign of town it's a real honour to be able to speak here uh, to you guys today. Uh, I grew up here, I was born in Blenheim, uh, and it's not often that you get to speak to uh, an illustrious crowd like this. Uh, you have a, you've, we've got a dame here, we've got a, we've got a, we've got an actor. Uh, I think uh, Tor Wak is around here somewhere. Uh, I've got uncles and aunties here. I've got cousins who I grew up with, and uh, my mum's down the back. Uh, so the video I just played uh, was produced a couple of years ago by uh, one of our cousins, Keelan Walker, uh, and it was. Uh, for Te Wiki o Te Reo Māori. Uh, the voice that you heard is another cousin of ours, Skylar Love, and I, want, I wanted to play that for a couple of reasons. Uh, one was to showcase some of the talent that we've got here in the Waido. The Waido doesn't just grow rugby players. Um, we've, we're full of talent here. Uh, the other reason I wanted to play that was to give you guys an indication of uh, the place I want to talk about today. Uh, it would have been quite cool, although the weather stinks, so it might not have been so great to go out there today, but the place is quite, it's quite awesome. Uh, and the other, another reason is because the topic I want to talk about is something that I find uh, particularly fascinating, and I think that it fits well with the, uh, with the theme of the, uh, with the symposium. Before I go any further, I should mention that the presentation is something that I prepared earlier. It was a, uh, it's a shortened version of an of a article that I, I wrote in collaboration with Richard Bradley. Uh, so many of you will know Richard. He's uh, dedicated a significant portion of his life uh, working for Rangitani. And uh, him and others uh, have achieved some outstanding results in the last uh, 20 years, including a treaty settlement and the return of ancestors back to the White Bar in 2009. Uh, my personal interest in the White Bar was somewhat delayed. 
Uh, three years ago, uh, Judith MacDonald, Mark Moses, Richard and I wrote a chapter for a book called The Treaty on the Ground. That chapter documented the experiences of those people who were tasked with negotiating the Kutahopal settlement. It was as a result of researching that chapter that my interest in the Wairau Bar was sparked. Uh, many of you will know that since the repatriation a whole bunch of uh, scholarly articles have been published and they've shed light on the life of those people who first settled down the bar. Uh, and all of that's absolutely fascinating, but it wasn't actually the science that hooked me. Uh, my interest in the bar was sparked by, by a man named Hohua Peter MacDonald, my grandfather's first cousin, uh, who was married to my great-grandmother's older sister. So we keep it pretty tight down the sounds. <laughs> uh, I first, I first came across uh, Peter via a, a number of letters he'd written to the Commissioner of Crown Lands in the 1930s, uh, expressing his displeasure at how the annual uh, mutton boot harvest was being managed, although that's code for uh, he was having a scrap with his walker cousin. Uh, but anyway, uh, so while carrying out research for the Treaty on the Ground chapter, uh, Richard gave me a series of articles uh, written in 1947 by, uh, by Hohua Peter MacDonald that were published in the Marlborough Express. Uh, the articles were part of a, a desperate attempt by Peter to stop the excavations then taking place at the Wairau Bar. At that time, uh, Peter was in his early 70s. Uh, I was then handed a copy of a 2009 report written by David Armstrong. I know this is sounding like a bit of a setup from Richard, but uh, the, 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 the report documented the history of the excavations and the circumstances that led to the removal of Koiwi Tangata and artifacts from the so called Moor Hunter site. Um, so it was then that Richard and I hatched this plan to bring together this history of protest, oral tradition, and science in a way that amplified our concerns and interests. That is to say, we wanted to provide a perspective, a perspective on the Wairo Bar which placed Peter's protests within a longer history of Kutahopo resistance to colonisation. Uh, this legacy of resistance eventually led to the repatriation and to a great extent the re reconciliation of the scientific community in Tangata Whenua. Uh, the last point I'd like to make is uh, I believe the science has been a catalyst for a refocusing of our attention from those male ancestors, who if the truth be told just blew into town, uh, to those female ancestors to who, we ultimately, who ultimately bind us to this place. Uh, so let's get underway. Uh, hopefully you won't fall, to, fall asleep. Rena tells me I've got quite a soothing voice. So. Uh, <laughs> So the significance of Te Pukahiwi has long been recognised. Uh, sorry, could you go to the first slide? Yeah. Uh, the significance of Te Pukahiwi has long been recognised. Uh, the origins of the people who first settled here, when they arrived, uh, their means of subsistence and their material culture are questions that scholars have attempted to answer. Uh, the scholarship can be traced back to 1912 when H.D. Skinner uh, document, documented the 21 kilometres of canals in and around the Wairau Lagoons. So um, this is one of the first maps uh, that were, that were uh, drawn of the Lower Wairau. Uh, the names on there which you saw in the video clip were actually uh, given to Skinner by this handsome fellow here. So this is Teoti MacDonald, so uh, he's the father of the MacDonald clan. Uh, but the mother was a mason. Uh, uh, it was, however, the accidental discovery of human remains by Jim Isles in 1939 that brought Te Pukahiwi into prominence. For three decades following Isles' discovery, uh, human remains and artefacts were removed from the site, often under the supervision of professional archaeologists, and most uh, significantly Roger Duff of the Canterbury Museum and his work would become one of the most important contributions to the development of New Zealand archaeology and theory. Uh, while archaeologists have revelled in the opportunities the bar has presented, for Tangata Whenua the experience has not been as positive. When Isles made his discovery, he set in motion a series of events that would occupy the lives of many. Isles, became the, Isles himself would become a fossicker and excavate the site, collecting a large number of artefacts 
Roger Duff's career would be greatly enhanced, and Rangitani ancestors, uh, Rangitani elders, would pass on to the next generation the burden of bringing their tūpuna home. In the end, it would be the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of those elders who first protested at the Waido Bar that would oversee the repatriation. Uh, Isles, Isles' January 1939 discovery included a moor egg, uh, a whalebone necklace and a human skull. The egg and necklace were deposited in the strong room of Blenheim's National Bank for safekeeping, but such was the interest, the artefacts were collected daily to be displayed in a local fish shop. The skull, designated Burial One, later named Auntie by her descendants, was reinterred by Isles' stepfather, Charlie Pirano. Soon after Isles' discovery, offers to purchase the artefacts began to arrive and eventually a deal was struck with the Dominion Museum, now Te Papa. £130 was paid for the moor egg and necklace. Auntie's fate, for the most part, has remained outside of public discourse. Having been disinterred, photographed and reinterred, she was dug up again and shipped to the Dominion Museum in Wellington. She, here she would remain until 2005 when Rangitani led a community initiative that saw many Wairo Bar uh, artefacts held at Te Papa and the Canterbury Museum loaned to the Millennium Art Gallery here in Blenheim for the Kaiputa Te Wairo exhibition. As a part of that initiative, Auntie was returned home. The first to make it back to the Wairo, it would take her another four years before she and many other tūpuna would finally be laid to rest. So uh, probably a few of you have seen this. This was a, a, a facial reconstruction that was, uh, that was done in 2012 as part of the Wairo Bar project. So uh, there were three, uh, three images of Tupuna that were uh, recreated. Uh, two were through uh, the kind of thing you see on uh, CSI. Uh, Auntie was uh, CT scanned and then sent to uh, Western Australian University where uh, Dr Susan Hayes came up with this image. Uh, in, March in March 1942, Isles made another discovery. While digging, in an, digging an air raid shelter, he came across a cache of rough, unpolished stone axes and chisels. Uh, that, according to the Marlborough Express, were not usually associated with Māori. Uh, he also found a real necklace similar to, similar to that belonging to Auntie. The following month, Duff visited to Pukahiwi and confirmed that the artefacts were archaic Polynesian and that the reels were made of moor bone. The conclusion then was that the site was the home of a more primitive and earlier type of culture than that that was brought to these shores by the fleet Māori, i.e. Rangitani. When Duff returned to Christchurch, he took with him a large number of artefacts on loan from Isles. Burial II, the owner of these taonga, was also uh, shipped to Christchurch. Duff later described him as a young man in the prime of his life, who in comparison to the other burials was, was furnished with the greatest accumulation of uh, offerings. Duff also considered Burial II to be the most suitable for museum display, and so he was until... Uh, until ongoing criticism forced Canterbury Museum to remove all core iwi from its display cases in 1986. In 1943, further core iwi tangata were uncovered. Burials 16A and 18 were also part of the ongoing story of Te Pukahiwi. Both were uncovered as a result of ploughing, a technique that Duff and Isles thought might produce better results. Duff recorded that burial 16 was one headless re reburied heap of bones. Duff also recorded that the skull of burial 18 had been shattered uh, by earlier ploughing, but he judged the remainder to be that of a middle-aged woman. Excavations at the Wairo Bar continued throughout the 1940s, 1950s and 1960s. The focus of the excavations at this time were the burials and grave goods. Duff compared the artefacts from Te Pukahiwi with artefacts from the Marquesas, Cook and Society Islands. He concluded that the people of Te Pukahiwi were of Eastern Polynesian origin, thus debunking the theory that Māori were a late arrival who had dispossessed an earlier Melanesian people. This is something we've all heard. Uh, Duff did not, however, challenge the chronology devised by S. Percy Smith, where the navigator Kupe arrived in 1910, Toi in uh, 1150, 
and the fleet in 1350. Rather, he argued that the more hunters of the Wairau Bar, while Polynesian, were part of an earlier migration led by Toi or Kupe. This, of course, allowed Duff to, to expound the theory that the burials he had been excavating were in no way connected to Rangitani because their ancestors had arrived with the so-called fleet. Rangitani opposition to the, to the removal of Tupuna began in 1947 when Peter MacDonald became aware of what was taking place. He took his complaints to the police, the Minister of Crown Lands, and as already mentioned, he wrote a series of articles uh, in the Marlborough Express. Uh, as far as Peter was concerned, the activities at the Wairo Bar amounted to nothing less than the desecration of a burial site. Peter's fight, however, was a one-sided affair. He had little hope of success. He was pitted against a scientific fraternity armed with the most up-to-date theories and methodologies and a Marlborough community who took great pride in Isles' finds. In his articles, Peter names and locates various villages and other associated burial grounds. Heading towards the Vernon Bluffs was Mutawekapa, which sat partly on Moripo, an island extending towards the centre of the lagoon. It was here, writes Peter, that Pūdama, the last of the Rangitani chiefs, was buried. Pūdama was the cousin of Terua Oneone, the chief of Kōwhai Pā, when it was sacked by Tarauparaha around 1828. Pūdama's nephew, Ihaia Kaikoda, signed the Treaty of Waitangi at Port Underwood in 1840, and Peter himself was the great-great-grandson of Pūdama. Peter also discussed the arrival of Rangitani in the South Island, having increased in number uh, until they occupied the area from Dannyvirk through to the Manawatu and onto Lake Horofenua, Rangitani looked south. According to Peter, pressure from the north and dissension among their own elders uh, compelled branches of Rangitani and Ngatiapa to migrate. The, mi the migrants eventually crossed Cook Strait and entered Tōtaranui, where they settled for a time at Ship's Cove. The area was already occupied by the Ngati Mamui, a tribe with whom Rangitani shared a similar culture and language. From here, Rangitani entered the Wairo Valley via the Pada Swamp at the foot of Hini I'll just go back. So, uh, I should have mentioned this earlier. So, people will recognise this, uh, this place. This is on your way through to Picton to catch the ferry. As you look straight down the main road, you'll see this peak here. Her name is Hini Kawariari and uh, she was a very early ancestress who married uh, a Ngati Mamoi fellow by the name of Fetuwal. Uh, Fetuwal stands on the other side of the valley. Couldn't quite get him in. Um, and this quite cool, uh, cool pass, which is covered by cloud there, that place is called Te Whiringa or Tukowai. And that name is reference to uh, to the tying up or the bundling together of resources that were taken from the Pada Swamp. It's also a reference to the uh, marriages that, uh, that Tukowai had. He married a woman called Hinirefa and begat queer, and hence Ngati queer. Uh, he married a woman called Ruamati, and that whakapapa extends right down the South Island. And he also married a woman called Hinipango. The occupation of the Wairo Bar took place during a, following a series of battles that were concluded with marriages between Ngati Mamui and the new arrivals. It was in this way that the descendants would have all ten toes embedded in the soil, to borrow Eddie Jury's, Eddie Jury's words. The marriages Peter refers to have been recorded in tribal Whakapapa manuscripts, allowing for an estimation of time at which these events took place, the late 17th or early 18th century being the most likely. Peter was the son of Te Oti MacDonald, the intelligent head of the natives cited by Skinner as the source of information relating to the fish traps adjacent to the Wairo Bar. Peter's maternal grandfather, Mehana Kiriopa, and uncle Tahuariki Mehana were during their, tri during their time tribal scribes whose whakapapa manuscripts would be integral to the, in the resurgence of the Kudahopal tribes during the 19th century. So, uh, this is Mehana Kiriopa on the left, his son Ta Tahuariki Mehana, and that's the, the manuscript. And up there is, uh, is Peter MacDonald and his, and his wife Sarah. And I think that was taken at a wedding anniversary? Yeah. 
So the, po the point I want to make here is that uh, Peter had access to the previous two generation, uh, previous two generations of tribal elders and holders of knowledge. So, despite his standing and credentials, Peter was in private ridiculed. He had asked Duff to respond to him through the pages of the Marlborough Express so that the public could decide the merits of the case. Declining the invitation, Duff instead wrote to Peter asking him why he was dragging the bones of his ancestors through ancestors before the eyes of the Pakia in the newspaper, which is uh, considering he was the fellow who put uh, Burial 2 on display in Christchurch for uh, everyone to see. It's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a cheek. Uh, Duff went on to uh, berate Peter and his knowledge. Uh, before writing to Peter, uh, Duff consulted WH Alvey. Alvey worked in the Lands and Survey Department in Blenheim. According to Alvey, Peter was after cheap notoriety, whose knowledge extended back no further than 100 years at the most. Alvey was also a, uh, a, an amateur ethnographer who, despite his, his apparent scepticism of Peter, was quite happy to uh, quote large chunks of his article in his own monograph, Kaputa Te Waito. Um, Peter's inability to prevent the excavations had much to do with Duff's reputation as a senior scholar. The theory advanced by Duff that the Wairo barbarials were Māori, but not the ancestors of Rangitani, was widely accepted. The fate of Tapukahiwi itself, the land, is essentially the story of colonisation. Historic crown land purchases and, su and subsequent ownership and leasing arrangements all undermine the ability of Rangitani to influence what was happening at the bar. It is worthwhile noting the Armstrong Report's conclusion that those with interest at the Wairo bar colluded to keep Rangitani in check, the extent of that collusion going so far as withholding a crown law opinion that raised questions as to who owned the Kōiwi and artefacts at law. At the time Peter was protesting, the Kūtahopo peoples of Te Tauihu were still living on, land, living on or near reservations created in the 19th century as a result of dodgy land purchases or landless natives legislation. Following World War II, however, people started to steadily move from the Pluris and Queen Charlotte Sounds, Port Gore, Cosales Harbour and Canvas Town to larger urban centres such as Blenheim, Nelson and Picton. In many cases, Still, Picton's an urban, urban environment. <laughs> in, those in many cases, uh, those families that settled in the Waido were, were in fact resettling. These urban migrants were the children and grandchildren of individuals who had been left out of the Waido reserves as a consequence of the Crown's failure to provide adequate reservations. This aside, uh, their return sparked a number of initiatives, including the establishment of Omaka Marae and the building of a Faritupuna. Uh, officially opened on the 27th of October 1985, Te Arohau Te Waipaunamu was the first carved meeting house in Te Tauihu in the post-war period. During the early 1980s, the Marlborough Māori community concentrated their energies on establishing a marae at Omaka, Te Arohau Te Waipaunamu, as the physical uh, manifestation of oral tradition and whakapapa. The name of the whare is suggestive of its geographical location a point of arrival and departure, a reality that is reflected in the whakapapa makeup of the tangata whenua. The popo and tukutuku that adorn the walls of the house retell the area's history, while at the same time giving us an insight into the thinking of those elders who provided guidance in its construction. These elders were the students of the previous generation's learned men and women, people such as Peter MacDonald and Iruera Po Hemi Fiddle. As one enters the courtyard in front of the whare, we are met with four male ancestors. At the apex of the whare stands Ngāhui, and beneath him Kupe. To Kupe's right stands Huataki, and to the left Marukaitātia. These ancestors represent different phases in the peopling of the Waido. At one level, they act as new monarchs for a more complex telling of the past. The story of Huataki, for instance, cannot be retold without reference to his Ngāti Mamui wives who, if the truth be told, are the more important characters in the story of the Waido. Inside the whare stand ancestors credited with supernatural powers. Te Ho, it is said, was resident in the Waido at the time of Kupe. His visit, uh, and, 
in the time of Kupe's visit, and their encounter caused earthquakes and tsunamis, resulting in the creation of significant landmarks. The building of Te Aroha o Te Waipounamu was a great achievement for the Marlborough Māori community, and since then Omaka has been the venue for a number of significant national hui. Indeed, it was here that the Wairau Bar Tūpuna would make their final stop before returning to Te Pukahiwi. Before then, however, high-level negotiations between parties would take place. The impetus for such negotiations were certain legislative changes and the emergence and acceptance of Māori-centred epistemologies. Another key development took place in 1998 when Canterbury Museum adopted Ngaitahu's Koiwi policy. Now the museum was required to consult with Ngaitahu when dealing with Koiwi Tangata, no matter where they were from. To this extent, the influence of then Terunanga or Ngaitahu chairperson Mark Solomon was important. Furthermore, Canterbury Museum's agreement to relinquish the Koiwi Tangata was not achieved without some pressure on the part of Rangitani, who were at the, who were at the time negotiating with the government to finalise their claim to the Waitangi Tribunal. Realising that research would be a condition of repatriation, Rangitani sought the advice of archaeologists Foss Leach and Janet Davidson. In previous years, they had established a positive relationship with the tribe, and it was at their suggestion that, Rangitani lead that the Rangitani leadership approached Professor Richard Walter at the University of Otago. At a hui held in Christchurch in, in September 2008, uh, the Otago researchers presented the proposed research program for the Wairau Bar, and in December the party signed a memorandum of understanding, the first of its kind in New Zealand. Unlike the excavations carried out by Duff and Isles, the research undertaken here was built on relationships and the mapping and mapping areas of trust. Prior to the Koiwi returning, being returned to the Waido, they were transported from Canterbury Museum to the University of Otago. Here they underwent examination, including isotope analysis of bone, tooth collagen and enamel. Isotope analysis reveals childhood residence and diet. The findings of that research suggest that isotopic signatures of burials 1 to 7, the group that, are, that includes auntie, may be representative of a tropical East Polynesian diet. These people were also the owners of the greatest number of taonga, including more eggs, necklaces and imitation jewellery. Isotope analysis, when taken in conjunction with other archaeological evidence, supports the hypothesis that these people were part of the founding population. Also carried out at the University of Otago was mitochondrial DNA sequencing. Genetic testing of koiwi was one aspect of the research program that aroused concern for, for Rangitani. It is fair to say uh, some of the leadership were actually opposed to it. In retrospect, however, it can be said that the sequencing of mitochondrial DNA, that is the DNA passed through the female line, has had some positive, albeit unexpected, results. Using this technique, geneticists have been able to trace the movement of peoples, uh, giving rise to the out of Africa or mitochondrial Eve hypothesis. Uh, mutations, and sorry about this, but there's a few numbers that I have to rattle off. Uh, should be okay. <laughs> uh, mutations constituting the so-called Polynesian uh, motif, or haplogroup B4A1A1A, there we go, uh, are found throughout the Polynesian Triangle. A recent study that investigated metabolic disease in Māori and Polynesians suggested that the genetics of Polynesian populations has been shaped by island-hopping mi island migration events which have possibly favoured thrifty genes, the result being an increased risk of disease. The study sequenced 20 modern Māori individuals and identified three previously unreported haplogroups within B4A1A1. Of the 42 tūpuna returned to the Waido as part of the repatriation, 19 were screened by University of Otago researchers, four of which provided sufficient data for analysis. Researchers were able to identify which haplogroup auntie, burials 1, 16 and 18 belonged. Researchers also found that these ancestors carried mutations that arrived in New Zealand on the voyaging canoes. If this is indeed the case, 
Muta these mutations are likely to be found in East Polynesia, and tracing them opens up the possibility of locating the point of departure from which the Waido people left. With such a fraught history, it is difficult to imagine any kind of reconciliation between the museum and archaeological communities. And Rangitani. The 2009 repatriation was a significant move in that direction. Alongside a 2014 treaty settlement, the repatriation stands as one of the most significant achievements of the last 30 years. Another significant moment and a step towards reconciliation occurred in June 2016 when, when Rangitani hosted the, the New Zealand Archaeological Association Conference at Ukaipo, the tribe's cultural centre. During the, conference, th uh, during the conference, three significant events took place. The results of the mitochondrial sequencing of the Wairo Bartupuna were presented. Participants had the opportunity to visit Te Pukahiwi, where researchers and Rangitani had retold the story of the Wairo. And as part of the Africa to Aotearoa project, Rangitani descendants were given the opportunity to have their DNA tested. This last event was led by Otago University Professor Lisa Matasaw-Smith. Many of the participants were interested to know if they were connected to those tūpuna at the Wairo Bar. It was explained that if they do share those same mitochondrial DNA signatures, that means that at some point they shared a direct common maternal ancestor. It could have been auntie, or it could have been a more distant ancestor in Hawaii. So, in December 2016, participants received the results, which showed unambiguously that some belonged to the same haplo groups as the Waido Bar people. Moreover, it was noted that all of the lineages identified were found throughout New Zealand and Polynesia, excepting B4A1A1C. This group, which includes Auntie and burials 16 and 22, have thus far only been found in East Polynesia, that is, New Zealand, the Cook Islands, Tahiti and Hawaii. A subsequent examination of Whakapapa suggests that at some point one or more female ancestors left the Waido and some time later a female descendant returned. This implies a high degree of mobility, a proposition supported by a growing body of evidence. Climatic changes associated with the so-called Little Ice Age and the extinction of the Moor would have compelled groups to, to move to areas conducive to horticulture. A population shift uh, out of the Waido did not mean a complete and full evacuation, however. Indeed, there is sufficient archaeological evidence to show a, continued, a continuity of occupation. The area around Orua Canal, which runs between the Opawa River and the Waido Lagoons, was excavated as part of the Mulberry District Council's upgrade of the Blenheim sewage plant. Radiocarbon dating of charcoal from seven sites indicated that the area had been occupied at different times between the middle of the 15th century through to the late 16th to early 17th century. Taking into account the archaeological signature left by Tupuna at Te Pukahiwi, the Waido has been occupied since first settlement. The repatriation and an increased understanding of auntie and her life has engendered an acute awareness in the Ahika community of, uh, of the Waido. The uh, this heightened awareness and sensitivity was recently seen in relation to a Heritage New Zealand investigation concerning damage to an archaeological site on the northern side of the Waido river mouth. The archaeological report commissioned as part of an out-of-court settlement noted that the estate comprised 13 sites, four of which were newly recorded. While most were middens or associated with cooking, uh, one site in particular was a burial site uh, that was discovered in 1961 and was considered by Duff to be contemporaneous with the Wido Bar. According to the report, all sites are of sufficient rarity uniqueness, and uniqueness by their association with the Wairo Bar archaeological landscape. And I told Auntie Molly I'd, I'd get her up on screen. Uh, so this is hot off the press. Uh, this was a submission in support of Heritage New Zealand's uh, submission to the, uh, Wairo, uh, to the Marlborough Environmental Plan to increase protections of areas down at the bar. Uh, so this is a really uh, neat picture because what I think this says is that 
Peter MacDonald's legacy of protest and persistence and also the things that uh, Dame Tariana spoke about uh, in her address is embodied in these people. Uh, whakapapa manuscripts, oral tradition and a carved meeting house are not only indicative of a deep interest in history and heritage, they are also constitutive of a kūtahopo epistemology. Indigenous knowledge systems, however, have struggled in the face of colonisation. The imposition or adoption of colonial structures, often deemed to be traditional, have resulted in a tendency to elevate male ancestors. The expectations of the native land court and its processes, coupled with the adoption of Christianity and its culturally defined hierarchies, has also resulted in the reification of patriarchy. The effect of Christianity was such, Huani MacDonald, the younger brother of Peter, uh, lamented that with the arrival of the missionaries and subsequent Māori conversion, the ancient gods withdrew their protection and retreated to the heavens, where, so our tōhunga tell us, they will remain until the Māori returns to his ancient customs and beliefs. So it's somewhat of a paradox, then, that science, often considered an instrument of Western imperialism, has been a catalyst for the inversion of patriarchy, a positive outcome of the Wairo Bar research, and in particular the mitochondrial DNA sequencing, has been a refocusing on the past. Auntie, who she was, how she lived, and how she died, has led to a greater interest from her ahikaro descendants and other female ancestors, Hini Kawariari, Te Heiwi, Faripoka, Ruamati, and Hini Pango. The stories of female ancestors, so often submerged beneath the deeds of their migrant husbands, are now being retold, albeit with the assistance of science. There is potential for this to challenge historical and contemporary structures such as 19th century crown purchases, native land court decisions and contemporary treaty settlement arrangements, which although settled, remain live in a customary world. So that's pretty much me, but um, this is the last slide I, I want to put up. And this is a, um, a picture taken uh, at a place called Hini Pango Drive, which is just out of Blenheim uh, to the north of the Waido. And it's a wetland that runs from uh, the, the Rarangi Bluffs through to, uh, through to the diversion. And uh, part of the hikoi on the day, so the 17th of June is the day in which uh, our man, uh, Ihai Kaikoda, signed the treaty out at Horohora Kakahu. So every year we try to... Uh, we tried to do something. So last year we um, got a crew of us together and we walked uh, the coastal boundaries of what was supposed to have been the 20 square mile reserve. And so we stopped at a number of places. And we, So this is Hinipango. Um, and this is, uh, thank you very much to, to Putahitanga because this year we're able to run some of these uh, run some of these wānanga and visit some of these sites. So, uh, nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. <laughs>